What's up everybody, my name is Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesia resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. I was recently on an off-site rotation giving anesthesia for a surgery at a non-Mount Sinai Hospital. Everything was going very well, no issues at all, it was a couple hours in the case, and then all of a sudden, my monitoring equipment and my computer screen go completely black. In this video, I'm giving you an in-depth look into a scary, actual power loss event that happened to me during a surgery. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribed to the channel. Let's dive into what happened. The reason that I wanted to make this video is not to scare you about potentially major problems that can come up during surgery, but actually quite the opposite. I wanted to give you insight into how an anesthesiologist training provides the skills needed to navigate patients safely through catastrophic events. And I'm not talking about problems that come up very frequently, if ever. In fact, anesthesiologists get trained on navigating catastrophic problems that they may never see in their entire career. But in the event that an anesthesiologist ever does encounter a problem like this, it's essential that they know what to do in order to get the patient safely through surgery. There's a natural tendency to think that problems in the operating room come up either directly related to the surgery or to the patient themselves. But it's important to step back and consider that there are problems that can come up that affect the equipment and things that are going on in the operating room. Before you can understand how serious a power loss in the operating room is, you have to understand what pieces of equipment require power. Obviously, we're not actually in the operating room right now. This is Mount Sinai's Department of Anesthesiology Simulation Lab, which the department has been great about letting me use. They've been very supportive with this channel, and if you'd like to find more information about Mount Sinai Anesthesiology, you can click the links in the description below. I'm gonna use the simulation lab to walk you through exactly what monitoring equipment we have. This isn't anything official, but categorically, the way I think about how power gets to all of this equipment is broken down into two different categories. So one is the ventilator itself and the ventilators actually have backup power supplies that last about a half an hour, and you can actually dial into the ventilator settings and see how much of a charge is left on it. Then, besides the ventilator, the other category of equipment is the monitoring equipment. So, two of the three screens that you see here are monitoring equipment. Then the third screen is actually the ventilator screen, which includes some information about monitoring, but not everything. There are four different aspects of a patient's physiology that we are required to monitor during surgery. Those aspects are oxygenation, which is how much oxygen goes into the patient's blood, ventilation, which is how much carbon dioxide comes out of the patient's blood, circulation, which describes the heart's ability to move blood around the body, and then temperature. There are many different ways to monitor all of these aspects of a patient's physiology. And as far as oxygen monitoring goes, there are two required ways. So the first is looking at the amount of inspired and expired oxygen, which we can see on this monitor right here. The second aspect of oxygenation is monitoring what percentage of hemoglobin molecules are carrying oxygen. And we can see that right here. It's actually routine for us to be able to listen to that information about oxygenation status, which is when you hear the typical beeping sound that's just like this. So this beeping sound tells us how fast a patient's heart rate is going, which is part of circulation, and then also the pitch that it's making tells us about what percentage of hemoglobin molecules are saturated with oxygen. So as the pitch goes down, that tells us that oxygen saturation is going down, and that typically is not a good thing. Next up is carbon dioxide, and we actually measure how much carbon dioxide is being blown off of the patient's lungs, which is what this tracing is right here. There are some very important physiologic consequences of having too much or too little carbon dioxide, and also the shape of this carbon dioxide curve, which is called capnography, can tell us a lot of information about someone's heart and lungs. The other aspect of ventilation that we monitor is for any circuit leak or disconnect, so if there's a circuit leak or disconnect, then these monitors will let us know with an audible sound. The third aspect of a patient's physiology that we monitor during surgery is circulation, and that includes at least three required components. The first is an EKG, which is an electrocardiogram, which we have continuously going, which you can see right here. That gives us detailed information about the electrical activity inside the heart itself. The next part of circulation is blood pressure, and we have a lot of different ways of monitoring blood pressure, and I'd say probably the most routine way is just putting a blood pressure cuff on a patient's arm and monitoring that at least once every five minutes, if not more frequently. And we see that readout right here on the machine. 
the third component of circulatory measuring is monitoring a patient's pulse, which we can either get from an EKG or we can get it from our pulse oximeter, which is the instrument that gives us the oxygen saturation level and also gives us a pulse. That's the one that made that nice sound that I like to hear just like this. The last aspect of patient physiology that's constantly monitored is temperature, which we can see right here. So just to summarize, this is all of our vital monitoring equipment that we have, which is separate from the ventilator and has its own power supply. Then shifting down to our ventilator screen right here, we get several pieces of information about patient physiology, but mostly we're getting information about the ventilator settings itself. Obviously this is extremely important, but it's not everything that we need to know about the patient. The last screen here that has a power supply is the computer that essentially takes all of the information from both the monitors and the ventilator and aggregates it into one screen. The computer keeps a historical record of everything that's gone on during the case and also allows me to input what medications I've given and at what time. So it's a really important part of keeping track of everything that's going on during the surgery. This screenshot's actually just something I found on Google Image Search, but it looks just like the electronic health records that we use, which shows how you can plot every piece of information that you get during a surgery over time on a computer so that you can look back on it at any point for reference. Now that you've gotten a sense of all of the important things that an anesthesiologist measures on their monitors, you can understand how big of a problem it is if all of those measurements disappear when the monitors turn off. So going back to the surgery, which was, like I said, a general abdominal surgery, it wasn't urgent, the patient was very stable the entire way through, and we were about a couple hours into the surgery, all of a sudden, my screen with all of my information about my patient monitors went black, my computer screen went black, and I rushed to press the power button, but nothing turned on. It may sound surprising, but nobody else in the room immediately knew that there was any problem at all. And even if they did, nobody else who was in the room at that time had any training on anesthesia equipment, let alone how to diagnose or fix any problems with it. To set the scene a little more for you, here's a quick overview of who was in the room and what exactly their jobs are. In this extremely rough sketch of the operating room that I made, you can see in the middle, there's the operating table with the patient that was on it, laying on their back under general anesthesia, intubated, with the abdomen partially open because they were being operated on by the surgery attending, who you can see here, and the surgery resident on the other side of the table. Keep in mind that this big red box with the anesthesia machine here has monitors that face me and don't face the surgery attending or the surgery resident or the other two people in the room who were the circulating nurse, which is a nurse who is not sterilely scrubbed and is able to assist with all sorts of things in the operating room including picking up the phone, which as I'll get to soon is very important. And then there's the scrub nurse who is scrubbed in sterilely and is able to assist with handing instruments to the surgeon and other tasks that are directly related to surgery. And then of course, there's me over here behind the drapes. So really, I was very by myself in the room with an attending anesthesiologist who was nearby. So there I was standing next to my anesthesia machine and I saw the monitors went black. I tried to turn them on and immediately realized that they weren't going to turn on. So the very first thing that I did was point to the circulating nurse, say their name, and tell them, call this phone number and ask for help. What I gave the nurse was a five digit phone number to call the anesthesia coordinator on call. And if they get a call saying that there's a problem and somebody needs help in an operating room, that coordinator will get all of the free anesthesiologists and send them directly into that room immediately. So you better believe that within 45 seconds, the room flooded with anesthesia attendings. The second thing I did immediately after calling for help was I told the surgeon to stop operating. Because of course, if I'm unable to assess the patient's vital signs, it's not safe for the surgeon to continue operating because we don't know exactly how the patient's doing under anesthesia. The third thing that I did was try to get together portable monitors so that I could at least make up for some of the monitoring equipment that I'd lost. I've mentioned in a previous video that I always carry with me a portable pulse oximeter, which I had with me and I put on the patient's finger so that I could get their oxygen saturation as well as their pulse. Next, I asked the circulating nurse to go try to find a portable blood pressure cuff and portable EKG lead so that I could have that equipment as well. By the time I did all this and assessed the patient's vital signs and made sure that everything was fine on the ventilator, the attending physicians who were in the room had already diagnosed the problem as a blown fuse and were able to change the outlets that my monitoring equipment was going to and turn it back on. Within about 10 minutes, we had electricians that came into the room, confirmed the problem, and were able to fix the blown fuse. 
As it turned out, some of the surgical equipment had been plugged into the same circuit as the anesthesia equipment, which overloaded the fuse and caused a short circuit. It's important to point out here that while hospitals have backup power through generators, that isn't going to work if a fuse is blown within a specific circuit. While that fact may sound trivial, it's actually something that gets tested on anesthesia board certification exams. So how does an anesthesiologist learn to deal with problems like this? I can tell you that in my first couple months of residency, we had a specific lecture with our program director, Dr. Adam Levine. He sat down with a ventilator in front of us and we walked through every possible scenario of losing power to monitors, losing power to the ventilator, losing backup power to the ventilator, and how we would deal with every one of those problems as it came up. Additionally, in my first couple months of residency, I was doing twice weekly simulations in that sim lab that I was showing you, where we went through all different types of problems, including mix-ups of gases, loss of gas in the operating room, and all different sorts of scenarios that we will probably never see in real life, but if we do see, we do have the training to be able to navigate those problems. And beyond that, when I'm in the operating room with my preceptor, Dr. Mark Sherwin, and also other anesthesia attendings, we commonly talk through what kinds of problems could come up, even if they're not actually happening, and then work through what we would do to diagnose the problem and then try and fix it. Definitely one of the challenges in training to become an anesthesiologist is learning how to feel comfortable with problems that come up very rarely. That's why it's really important to have a good simulation curriculum, and it's also really important to have preceptors who are thinking about these sorts of problems and teaching you what you might do in the event that you encountered them. I think that sometimes there's a misconception that anesthesiologists just sit around in an operating room while surgery is going on. And don't really do very much, but in reality, anesthesiologists have to be anticipating problems that could come up and what they would do to fix them. That especially includes issues related to airway, breathing, IV access, hemodynamic instability, factors directly related to the surgery itself, and then of course, the equipment in the operating room. These are some of the aspects of anesthesiology that really appealed to me and why I thought it would make the perfect career choice. Well, that's all for this video. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.